You're listening to The Globalist, first broadcast on the 3rd of September 2021 on Monocle 24. The Globalist, in association with UBS. Hello, this is The Globalist, coming to you live from Midori House in London. I'm Georgina Godwin. On the show ahead, the Taliban is preparing to reveal a new government. But what form will it take and who will recognise it? Then... The WHO hub promises to deliver three key things. Better data, better analytics and better decisions. We hear more about the World Health Organization's initiative to prevent future pandemics. Plus, we'll ask how can Norway's sovereign wealth fund built on oil profits sit easily alongside a climate change agenda? Also ahead... And we learned that local authorities have felt it necessary to put up a sign saying no peeing towards Russia. It's Friday, so Andrew Muller will give us his usual wry look back at the week that was. We'll also flip through the papers and get the latest movie news too. That's all ahead here on The Globalist, live from London. First, a look at what else is happening in the news. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga has announced he will step down after a one-year tenure marred by an unpopular COVID-19 response. In the United States, remnants of Hurricane Ida continue to wreak havoc. Flash flooding killed at least 44 people in four northeastern states as torrential rains swept away cars, submerged New York City subway lines and grounded airline flights. And French President Emmanuel Macron has unveiled a multi-billion euro plan to turn Marseille into what he called a world city. Stay tuned to Monocle 24 throughout the day for more on those stories. But first, now that the Taliban has swept back into power in Afghanistan after 20 years of war, they're shortly planning to reveal a new government. The new administration is keen to be recognised by the West as a legitimate power as the country faces economic meltdown and is badly in need of donor funds. Well, joining me on the line now is Lynn O'Donnell, former AP and AFP bureau chief in Afghanistan. Uh, Lynn, thanks for coming on the programme again. Before 2001, when the Taliban pre previously controlled the country. What was the system of government they used? Um, the Hi, Georgina. Thanks for having me on. It was pretty much a top-down system with Mullah um, Omar, the one-eyed um, leader and f- co-founder of the organisation, very much in charge. And what we're seeing now is, is pretty much um, it looks like they're going to have the man who has uh, the job, the position that Mullah Omar had, Haibatullah Akhanzada, also as a symbolic head. The thing about Alcanzada is that he hasn't been seen in public for a couple of years and there have been rumours that he uh, died of COVID last year. So that remains to be seen. But um, below that uh, putative sort of symbolic uh, position, uh, there is likely to be a 12-man governing shura, a council. And there there was talk a couple of weeks ago amongst people that I was uh, discussing this with that um, there would be, um, they were aiming for an inclusive style of government that would bring in uh, people from uh, ethnic and religious uh, groups that are not of the um, uh, uh, same ilk um, uh, as the Taliban, for instance, um, Hazaras, Uzbeks, um, uh, Tajiks and uh, Shias. Um, But what they've been doing so far indicates that inclusivity is not really likely to be at the heart of whatever government they come up with in the near future. Mm. I mean, they have promised to protect human rights and refrain from reprisals against old enemies. But then we hear a senior member saying uh, there will be no democratic system at all because it doesn't have any base in our country. We won't discuss what type of political system we should apply in Afghanistan because it's clear it's Sharia law and that's it. Well, can Sharia be democratic? Is that indeed what they plan to do? 
No, democracy is is indeed not at the heart of what the Taliban um, is, and I don't think there's going to be any role for it. Uh, women MPs are already being told that they won't be able to uh, return to Parliament, and the positions that are being filled so far, um, district governors, provincial governors, even people running um, hotels, are being given to uh, mullahs. Uh, it looks very much like the um, difference between word and deed is is uh, very very wide, and that uh, their own uh, their own people are going to be rewarded for their loyalty, and that Pashtun nationalists and mullahs who have senior positions in the Taliban hierarchy are the ones who are going to win. Democracy is not part of it, and even when they say, when the Taliban leadership say that Sharia law is going to be what prevails, they have uh, no interpretation. Um, made public of what Sharia law is. And this is what we've heard all along about the way they want to treat women. Women will be respected and will have a role in, in life in Afghanistan according to Sharia law, but with no um, uh, indication of what that actually means. Mm. I mean, we've talked before about whether the Taliban really have any real desire to govern. Well, they have to now. Do they have the necessary skills? They don't have the skills, but <clears throat> excuse me, I think that they do have the awareness that those skills are needed if they're going to run a country. But still, we're more than two and a half weeks after um, they took over. And uh, still, most of the banks are not working. People do not have access to cash. They can't buy food. Uh, food uh, basics like food and fuel are running low. Um, inflation is soaring. There is no indication so far that uh, they came in with any idea of governance. Um, I think they uh, are aware because they are in discussions with uh, NGOs and with foreign governments and agencies. Um, and of course, China and Russia and Pakistan and Iran are active uh, in Afghanistan with the Taliban. So they know that they need help. It's just where that help is going to come from and what sort of form governance is going to take that remains the big question. Mm. I mean, what deals will need to be done to gain that, that vital international recognition? Well, it remains to be seen. I mean, they don't really need the West anymore apart from uh, money and financial support. But we don't know yet whether the money and financial support that has been coming from the West for the last 20 years will be replaced by, for instance, China and Russia. Uh, do Does China want to send um, its NGOs in to replace those that have been there in the past? I kind of doubt it. Um, some of the uh, aid work that has been going on for the last 20 years continues in the provinces outside of of Kabul. Um, but uh, big funders like the World Bank um, are pretty steadfast so far in not um, opening the spivot of cash again so that the country can start to function. So um, at the moment, uh, time is marching on. Uh, conditions are getting worse. People are getting very upset and frustrated. And uh, very real problems like food shortages um, in places outside of Kabul are just getting worse. Mm. So, I mean, I know you have m many friends still in Afghanistan. Can you describe the, the, the situation there? Is there still a great deal of violence? Uh, yes, um, the violence is going on uh, very much under the surface. We're only seeing and have only seen for the past couple of weeks Afghanistan through the prism of Kabul, uh, regional media organisations were closed down as the Taliban took over and now we're seeing um, a, a very a, a very concerted effort at controlling the message and beneath that violence is very definitely uh, still a, um, a feature of day-to-day -day life. People are afraid and now that the international military presence has ended and the, um, the view of the cameras and the, the world media on what's going on in Afghanistan is, uh, is narrowing and very much has been focused, for instance, on what was happening at the airport, um, people are afraid that what's happening to them will get worse um, as the world turns away. Mm. Are people still able to leave now that the official evacuation's over? 
no, there's no leaving. There's no visas. There's no um, land borders open. There's no flights. The airport is unlikely to function for very many more months. So the the short answer is no. People cannot leave. They are now trapped. Mm. Uh, and finally, do we have any kind of idea of a timeline of when a government will be established and and when it can start healing? Uh, I think the healing is going to be a long way off, no matter what timeline there is for establishing a government. But um, the Taliban always takes an incredibly long time to do things. Discussions in the past with, um, for instance, um, peace brokers from the United Nations or um, as we saw with the peace talks that uh, the former US President Trump brokered. Everything takes an enormously long time and you can't believe the reports that we've had over the last um, couple of days about what shape the government might take um, or even the discussions that I had with people a couple of weeks ago of what their what their plans are. Everything is fungible and everything changes and everything is likely to take a very long time. Lynn O'Donnell, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Georgina. Thanks for having me. The World Health Organization, which connects the UN's 194 member states on health policy, has launched a pandemic intelligence hub. Based in Berlin, this new initiative will try to help governments identify future pandemics at an earlier stage and improve monitoring of new variant strains of COVID-19. Well, on the line is Dr Chris Smith, Monocle's health and science correspondent. Good morning to you, Chris. Um, Why is this body necessary? How is global health monitored at present? We've been saying for a very long time, and I I say that's we as in the international scientific community, that the key to preventing outbreaks and also critically the spread of outbreaks around the world is knowing what's going on where. It's basically ears, eyes and boots on the ground. And this pandemic situation we're in now has told us really the importance, again, or reaffirm the importance of a surveillance network. We were also reminded of this in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic, where it really caught everyone by surprise. And the pattern that emerges every time is you get big outbreaks of things because stuff creeps up on us, because Mm. we don't have a big radar screen with international cooperation, everyone working together, keeping an eye out for what's out there. And things, and things catch us out. And, and I think the, the motivation here is to try. It's a first step towards trying to create those, those eyes and ears on the ground so that this happens less, less frequently in future. Mm. So how would it work then in, in practice? Well, the details are slightly vague because this is just an initial concept which hasn't been implemented fully yet. But the notion is one that they want to put a centre in Germany And in that centre, there will be 100 scientists, but these are not resident staff. This is really a forum. There will be perhaps 100 people from groups internationally who will come and go. It's almost like hot desking for scientists, but you can host projects in these places. And and there's a model for doing this kind of thing. Cambridge University has got the Maxwell Centre, for example. The idea is that you've got a core staff who introduce or make introductions between businesses and industry and academics who can solve problems this is a similar sort of crucible where you can bring together and and forge relationships and solve problems collaboratively in the center that's that's sole mission is keeping an eye on the international community scientifically and what is happening on the ground in terms of infectious outbreaks and that kind of thing. Mm, But it would rely on transparency and I wonder if nations would be happy to comply. I mean, we've already we've already observed China's reticence. You've hit the nail on the head, in my view. And I I think that's the, the, the detail that's that's, you know, going to be the make or break linchpin, because time and again, we've seen situations where countries have not been forthcoming, either once we're in a pandemic situation or with outbreaks or before they happen and at the outset. And it's at the outset that it's really critical. It's knowing what is happening early in the same way that once you've got an inferno raging, trying to put the fire out, it's a totally different measure, control measure. It's a totally different approach. It's a totally different outcome. 
Whereas if you've got a few sparks landing on the ground and you have people who are watching them come down and can stamp on them promptly when they arrive, the impact is much lower. But it does depend on people cooperating. And, and you, you highlight one country that has a really bad track record in this area. Mm. China has a really bad track record in a number of areas, but it's got a really bad track record for pandemics. With the first SARS, we're about to meet and greet in two years' time the 20th anniversary of SARS Mark I, the first outing of a coronavirus that spread around the world initially for six months without anyone knowing and, and claimed, in that case, only hundreds of lives and caused thousands of cases. This one, very different. But there is something that unites both, which is that there was reticence on the part of China in both cases to warn people promptly, to share data early, and therefore potentially head this off at the pass before it became an international problem. So, I mean, but, no amount of intelligence hubs is going to make a difference to that? Well, I think it's a start, isn't it? And, uh, and what people are saying is that continuously China are reporting that they feel bruised by attacks on, say, climate from the Americans. And um, because it's a bit of a case of if you live in a glass house, don't lob stones. Well, really, if you've got a forum, you've got a community and you are transparent and open about it and you invite people to come and take part, it does build trust. And hopefully, uh, once you've got some momentum up, that, that trust can actually be implemented internationally. But, you know, time will tell. But having, having an, a system that is at least doing this and is at least bringing people together and reminding people of the kinds of factors that lead to infectious disease outbreaks, it it does push this up the agenda. I, I still think it's uh, a big a big and tall order given the threat that we, we pose from this. And we've been saying for a very long time that the, this is a very real, th- real threat. I think a centre with uh, non-resident staff and, a, and 100 people or so in it, it sounds like a fairly small uh, bit of infrastructure for such a critical job. And, uh, and I wonder how effective it, it will be. But one mustn't be critical before one has seen what it can do. Mm. I mean, do you think that if it had been in existence in 2019, this pandemic could have been stopped? That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. One would like to say, yes, it would have immediately spotted it and China would have volunteered all the information and we would have immediately uh, pounced on this virus and stopped it spreading. I think it's probably more complicated than that, but we must live and learn. And if one of its first jobs is to pull together all the strands of evidence of what unfolded, how it happened, how it spread, and begin to see where the weak points are, then we have a chance of being able to put in place systems that will spot them and stop them. And even if it's it's helping countries to develop a joined up strategy so that when this happens in your country, this is what you do, type copybook, so that there's a procedure to follow or there's a network of people who talk to each other so that it, it's not this kind of rag bag kind of a chaotic response with different people doing different things at different times and, and the virus slipping through all the gaps between each each time, having that more consistent approach, I think would be very helpful. And so it's a start. But, mm. you know, I, I don't I go back to my point that I, I don't think something with 100 people in it maximum non non resident is going to solve the world's problems tomorrow. But it is an important beginning. Uh, and how's it going to be funded, Chris? Well, it's a World Health Organization initiative. I think there's probably a, r- a range of things. One, there'll probably be some funding from the WHO, and this is my way of saying I don't know how it's going to be funded, but I suspect there'll be some support from the WHO, but that there will be input from the member countries and the stakeholders that take part, most probably. This is the model, how when one of these sorts of places gets pulled together, it's a collaborative venture. So you have a bit of core funding that runs the building, and then you have projects that bring support with them so the the money follows the people and the participants that's the usual way of doing it but but the details haven't been published or or at least have not been made visible yet Mm. and and finally chris will their first priority other than unpicking what happened be to uh, look out for variants It, it might be it's more that one has to be very cautious about having your eye pulled off the ball by one particular dominant threat A good example of this, when we had the swine flu pandemic, everyone was obsessing about swine flu in the hospitals and there were patients dying of things like MRSA and C. diff because we were missing cases of things because everyone was saying, oh, let's worry about the flu and we were ignoring another elephant that was rapidly appearing in the room. So 
I suspect, yes, there will be roles for it in watching how the present pandemic unfolds, but they mustn't take their eye off the off the horizon because that's the job of a place like this to begin to look for other threats. And we know that there are other places on Earth that are a pressure cooker building up potential outbreaks. And I mean, the African continent is rife and ripe for this happening because it's got a big population that's growing very rapidly with poor infrastructure. And it's that sort of toxic combination of poverty infrastructure that's quite weak communication that's quite weak but but a mobile populace that can spawn outbreaks like the ebola outbreak and so it's going to be watching poorer countries and helping them i think that is our priority for the future because it's probably the african continent where we're going to see more problems like this in future because they're having their current population explosion a bit like china did in previous decades Chris, thanks very much indeed. That's Dr Chris Smith there. Now, still to come on the programme, we ask if Norway's sovereign wealth fund can avoid being political. We get the latest movie news and... We learned that a judge in Leicester had sentenced a young man convicted of taking too close an interest in white supremacist nonsense and bomb-making instructions to instead read the works of Jane Austen, Thomas Hardy, Anthony Trollope and Charles Dickens and to report back to court to be tested on what he'd learned quite possibly to really dislike white English people if he makes it through that lot. This is The Globalist. Stay tuned. UBS has over 900 investment analysts from over 100 different countries. Over 900 of the sharpest minds and freshest thinkers in the world of finance today. To find out how we could help you, contact us at UBS.com. Norway's $1.4 trillion sovereign wealth fund is the largest in the world, owning on average 1.4% of every listed company on earth. It began 25 years ago, and Norwegian politicians have always laboured the point that the fund is a financial investor and not a political tool. Well, my guest today questions that. Joining me from Oslo is Richard Milne, Nordic and Baltic correspondent for the Financial Times. Richard, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us uh, about the origins of the fund and its growth over the last quarter of a century? Yeah, well, it's it's really quite an extraordinary thing, especially in a democracy. You tend to find sovereign wealth funds, um, you know, in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait. Um, and so uh, even back uh, in, in, in the 60s, late 60s, when oil was first found, and then the 70s, uh, Norway never really thought that it would amount to that much. And they, they, they explored a mechanism and they eventually came up with the oil fund, which is a way of diverting sort of all the tax revenues that they receive from oil and gas um, into a fund o- on the basis that the it was a bit of a windfall, these oil and gas uh, revenues, natural resources, and that they should be shared by future generations of Norwegians, not just current generations. And it's pretty interesting. Every time I write a story about Norway's oil fund, um, the, the the most common comment is people in the UK saying, well, why didn't we have one? Um, uh, and basically in the UK, the oil revenues were, were spent in the 80s mm. um, just through the budget. So it was pretty far-sighted of Norway to set this up. And how, how has it changed its focus over the years? Um, so it's gradually, it was a very boring investor to begin with, just in bonds. Um, it's become a bit racier, a, a lot in stocks. I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, it's extraordinary. It owns 1.4% of every listed company on average in the world. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of extraordinary. And um, uh as it's got bigger and bigger than anybody ever expected, um, you know, with power comes responsibility. And uh, there's been a sense that it needs to start taking positions on everything from climate change to executive pay. Um, But then, of course, when you do that as a sort of state body, um, even if you're trying to be a financial investor, you know, if you say that, um, you know, Goldman Sachs shouldn't have a chief executive and chairman who are the same person or that this chief executive executive is overpaid um it's you, you start to stray into the um uh world of uh, whether you're acting politically mm, exactly i mean in your your you have a great piece in the ft and you 
you ask if a fund that's ultimately controlled by Norway's parliament and government and, uh, and makes decisions on what to invest in and more crucially what not to invest in can not be thought of as acting politically. Yeah, well, and I think I, I, I quote the Norwegian professor in there who says that basically everything is political one way or the other. And um, I, I, and I think it's also just, you know, it's $1.4 trillion uh, now, which is, you know, a mind-boggling sum of money. Um, and that starts to burn a hole in people's pockets. And, um, you know, so Norway's uh, parliament, they're having elections um, uh, in 10 days' time. Uh, and many of these parties would like to use more of the money, would like to use it in a different way. They'd like to use the fund um, maybe more aggressively to combat climate change. Um, you could see nine parties in po parliament. It's going to be an incredibly fragmented parliament. And, um, you know, all that taken together means that the fund is likely to be prodded um, more politically. And um, I, I don't know, I think it's going to be very interesting. It's basically an experiment in, in, in democracy. Um, and we're going to see how it goes. And, and in terms of, of, of what's not invested in, for, for instance, uh, tobacco has been dropped. What else is barred? So they back, uh, they banned tobacco early on, but not alcohol. Um, they banned uh, nuclear weapons producers. Um, and then um, about five or six years ago, they banned coal, uh, both um, companies that produce it and that use it a lot. Uh, and recently um, they came up with a, a ban on so-called um, uh, uh, oil exploration and production groups, which I mean, sounds exciting, but it's basically very few oil groups. Um, they're, they're mostly, um, it excludes all the big oil companies you can think of. Um, and so that's always led to, you know, why do they exclude some groups and not others? Why do they ban some sectors and not others? You know, and this starts to get very political. And then just this morning, they've announced um, that they're having another review of a certain aspect of the fund. Um, and it's going to be headed um, by foreign pol policy analyst. Um, and they've always said that this isn't a foreign policy tool. So it's uh, it's quite striking. Um, and I think this is sort of thing It's just in a democracy, everything is under a bit more spotlight and pressure. Um, mm. Do you think that the mandate then of, of the fund should be changed? Well, this is the big question. I mean, I think climate change is one of the is probably the key issue here. It, it's increasingly difficult um, uh, for a fund to avoid taking a position on climate change. Um, and then comes the, the, you know, this is a fund based entirely on revenues from oil and gas. Um, so is it hypocritical that uh, an oil fund would uh, take, uh, you know, an aggressive position on, on climate change? Or is that actually rather enlightened and a good thing um, I think there probably needs to be some definition of what uh, a responsible investor what that means um, uh, you know very buzzwords um, for you know our pension funds and, and, and everything but um, you know when it's in a democracy if it's not really set out then then it can be um, uh, well not abused but it can be maybe not used in the way that people want it to be used so um, you know I think I think basically as the size increases and it's heft in world markets increases, the debate is only going to increase around the fund. Mm. Uh, and finally, I mean, do you think that it is too powerful? And how could that be curtailed? Well, so that's the, the, the review I mentioned that was announced today is looking at whether the, the fund is currently housed in the country's central bank, and it's looking at whether it should be put in the, um, its own organisation. Previously, the um, uh, the current finance minister floated to me about eight years ago whether the fund should be broken up into two or more parts because it was so big. I, I don't think any of those things are, are going to happen. I think um, it's just something that the fund is going to have to live with. It's going to be increased increasingly in the spotlight. It's rather lived in the shadows up till now. Um, and, 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 you know, some of these debates and issues are going to be rather uncomfortable for it. But um, at the same time, it's in a democracy. It can have sort of political legitimacy. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to follow, but I think there's a good chance that um, it's still viewed as a great success um, in, in the years to come. Richard, thank you very much indeed. That was Richard Milner. And here's what else we're keeping an eye on today. 
Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga has announced he'll step down after a one-year tenure marred by an unpopular COVID-19 response. Suga, who took over after Shinzo Abe resigned last September, has seen his support rating sink to below 30%. His decision not to run in the ruling Liberal Democratic Party election means the party will choose a new leader who will become Prime Minister. In the United States, remnants of Hurricane Ida continue to wreak havoc. Flash flooding killed at least 44 people in four northeastern states as torrential rains swept away cars, submerged New York City subway lines and grounded airline flights. Ida is one of the most powerful hurricanes ever to strike the U.S. Gulf Coast. And French President Emmanuel Macron has unveiled a multi-billion euro plan to turn Marseille into what he called a world city. Some one and a half billion euros will be spent on security, transport, housing and culture and around around 1.2 billion euros on schools alone in France's second largest city. This is The Globalist. Stay tuned. It's time now for a roundup of all the things we know now as the week comes to a close that we didn't know on Monday. Here's Andrew Muller. We learned this week that if we fear the consequences of COVID-19, it is probably only because we are either godless heathens unconvinced that this world is merely some sort of antechamber to the cloud-born harp farm where all is peace and bliss, or perhaps that we are sin-burdened infidels well aware that our eternal destination is somewhere rather warmer. <laughs> And we learn this from Tate Reeves, Governor of Mississippi. That is a terribly cheap shot, honestly. Do better. (laughs) Governor Reeves, accounting for the laggardly take-up of vaccines among his remaining voters, explained that Mississippians have their minds on loftier concerns than just not dying of more or less avoidable symptoms of a rampaging virus. The governor's words will now be voiced by Monocle's Hellfire and Brimstone desk chief, Fernando Augusto Pacheco. I'm often asked by some of my friends on the other side of the aisle about COVID and why does it seem like folks in Mississippi and maybe in the Mid-South are a little less scared, shall we say. When you believe in eternal life, when you believe that living on this earth is just a blip on the screen, then you don't have to be so scared of things. There will now be a short pause while listeners take a wild guess which American state has this week the highest per capita rate of new COVID cases in the United States and the second highest per capita rate of overall deaths. No prizes will be awarded at this time. Elsewhere... We continued to learn of the astonishing thin-skinnedness of Russia, a nation which is, lest we forget, geographically vast, militarily powerful, culturally marvellous, historically maybe a bit weird, but really, who isn't? Yeah. No, we haven't given the general muttered agreement file a run for a while, actually. Nice to have it back. Anyway, we learned that the audiences at the comedy clubs for which Moscow is justly renowned will heretofore have to do without the whimsical stylings of Idrak Mirzalizadi, a Belarusian comedian resident in the Russian capital, now packing his bags, supervision of which by hatchet-faced stooges in fur hats and greatcoats clutching Kalashnikovs could not be confirmed as this monologue went to air. Mr. Mirzalazadi made a joke which failed to amuse someone at Russia's Ministry of the Interior, which has now gonged the hapless japester off in thunderously forbidding terms which will now be translated by Monocle's Russian dudgeon desk chief and producer of this monologue, Christy Evans. Idrak Mirzalizade made expressions that incite hatred and enmity towards persons of Russian nationality humiliating their human dignity. In this regard, his presence on the territory of the Russian Federation was recognised as threatening public order, the rights and legitimate interests of others. 
everyone's a critic. But we further learn that such is Russia's hypersensitivity to the slightest slight that even the neighbours are having to tiptoe in a manner of speaking. We learn that as one drives towards Grenzi Jakobselv in the deep north of Norway... Come on, Christy, let's have some howling blizzard wind and polar bears or whatever. The road runs alongside a creek which delineates Norway's border with Russia, and we learn that local authorities have felt it necessary to put up a sign saying, no peeing towards Russia. The fact that the sign is in English either suggests that tourists are more of a problem than locals, or, and we cannot, we fear, rule this altogether out, that the story is basically nonsense, waved into print around the world under the too-good-to-check clause beloved of journalists, but we did learn, because by golly we do our research, that Norway has had since 1950 dedicated laws governing conduct along its border, specifically prohibiting, quote, offensive behaviour behaviour directed at the neighbouring state or its authorities. The practical upshot of which we learned is that contributing to the flow of the Jakobselva River can get you three months in the clink. Let's have some twee pastoral English music now. Because, here in the UK, we learned of a more imaginative line in judicially imposed punishments. We learned that a judge in Leicester had sentenced a young man convicted of taking too close an interest in white supremacist nonsense and bomb-making instructions to instead read the works of Jane Austen, Thomas Hardy, Anthony Trollope and Charles Dickens, and to report back to court to be tested on what he'd learned quite possibly to really dislike white English people if he makes it through that lot. While it is arguable that the beak might have more usefully directed the defendant in this instance towards James Baldwin and Webb Du Bois, there might be something usefully deterring in this idea. British crime may well ebb dramatically if miscreants, scoff laws and ne'er-do-wells were threatened on a scale starting at, say, Charlotte Bronte for shoplifting, rising to George Eliot for murder. For Monocle 24, I'm Andrew Muller. Hush, that was a very long, drawn-out ending, Andrew Muller. Thank you very much indeed. This is The Globalist. Let's continue now with today's newspapers. Joining me in the studio is Simon Brook, journalist and communications consultant. Good morning to you, Simon. Good morning, Georgina. Now, we've just been uh, hearing in our headlines that after only a year, the Japanese Prime Minister is stepping down. His his uh, uh, popularity ratings are just through the floor. I mean, 30%. Uh, that sort of happened too late for most of the papers, but there is a bit more information around. What can you tell us? There is, yes. Um, exactly. The, the Financial Times won a, a number of public applications uh, leading with this story and pointing out, as you say, that he won't be seeking re-election in this month's leadership race for the Liberal Democratic Party. Um, but uh, uh, the reason for his lack of popularity, really, as the FT points out, is his, the fact that he has failed to uh, contain COVID-19. And obviously, this was particularly important with the Tokyo Olympics. So that probably has um, probably really you know, dealt the, the death blow, if you like, to his popularity and uh, his ability to lead the country. Uh, the FT, obviously, taking an economic angle as well, points out that uh, um, this led to an extended rally in Japanese stocks and took the uh, the benchmark topics to a 30-year high. Um, so the idea being that uh, a change of leadership, not only would it be better for the, ec- for the sort of management of COVID, but also, as the paper points out, would usher in greater stimulus. So ho- a lot of uh, Japanese company hoping that, uh, companies hoping that a change of leadership is going to be good for the economy. Absolutely. That's a story I'm sure we're going to be following very closely. Uh, now, another thing we've been discussing today, uh, as indeed we have been for some time is the Taliban. We were talking today about them forming a government uh, and that's because, of course, they are desperate to be recognised and then get access to donor funds. Uh, The Telegraph reports that they say that China is their closest ally. 
Yeah, is this is this one of the worst the worst worst fears come true? I suppose is the question, isn't it? Yes. So the group spokesman, according to the uh, Telegraph, has said that Beijing is quote ready to invest and reconstruct uh, Af- in Afghanistan. China is the Taliban's principal partner in the international community, uh, according to um, the Taliban. Uh, the China will be helping. Uh, the Taliban helping the Afghan economy by providing a gateway to global markets. Uh, it's reported uh, the Chinese would revive Afghan copper mining and production, and obviously, you know, com- country devastated by uh, civil war and, and uh, conflict uh, and things. They will be looking to get that economic uh, power going again. The question is, of course, um, to what extent will this is this a trap? If you like, uh, will the Chinese government just lead the Afghan government into greater debt? And this is something. Thing we've seen uh, in a number of uh, African countries. So um, the, there's a there's an economic question and also, of course, a sort of geopolitical question as well. I think one of the interesting things as well is it is is what position. Joe Biden will take on this. Um, He's, as we know, very tough on China, describing President Xi as a thug. And one of the reasons it's reported uh, that one of the reasons why he wants to get out of Afghanistan is to sort of allow him to focus more on dealing with what he thinks are the bigger threats, which is China and Russia. So um, this is obviously already uh, pushing that much much higher up his agenda. Mm. And I suppose, I mean, with Britain becoming increasingly irrelevant on the world stage, it doesn't really matter that our, our hapless foreign secretary has said that, uh, that that Britain won't be recognising the Taliban in the foreseeable future. Well, that's the, that's the question, is it? In which case, how do you hold them to account? Mm. How do you make sure that uh, they're going to do all the things that we've asked them to do? There was a, there was a big... The, the West, certainly uh, the US, has made a big play of the idea that even though we're withdrawing when it comes to sort of human rights and the, the fate of the country, we'll be keeping an eye on you uh, and making sure that you behave like a sort of civilised government in as much as that's possible. But, yeah, very difficult to do that, I suppose, if you are, are saying that we don't actually recognise the the governing party. Mm. I want to go to the New York Times now and talk about this Texas abortion law uh, because it's just extraordinary. Um, I got sent a thing today uh, and it's an anonymous tip line. It says, help enforce the Texas Heartbeat Act. If you want to help us, uh, then anonymously, or you have a tip on how you think the law has been violated, fill out the form below. We won't follow up with or contact you. I mean, that is inviting people to report others for going to an abortion clinic. And this law means that even if you're the taxi driver taking them there, you can report them. It really is terrifying, isn't it? I think it's fascinating because I, I, I think in the, in the rest of in Europe, for instance, we cannot understand why abortion is an issue in the US, can we? I think for us, it's just accepted. It's what happens. I mean, obviously, the, the length, the termination period might be a debate sometimes. And this perhaps. is, of course, six weeks. This is the Yeah, this absolutely. Yeah. But, but in this case, uh, we, I think it's, it's extraordinary. It does seem extraordinary to a lot of people outside the US that this should be an issue. But yes, exactly. The New York Times reporting that the Supreme Court's decision not to block this law passed in Texas, um, which sharply curtails abortions, has really pushed abortion up the political agenda. Um, The New York Times says, you know, for Democrats, it was a nightmare come true. A conservative Supreme Court led by three appointees of former President Donald Trump had allowed a highly gerrymandered Republican controlled state legislature to to circumvent uh, Roe versus Wade, which is, of course, the case that has made that made abortion legal in the U.S., It also reports uh, that uh, Democrats embrace the opportunity to force an issue they believe is a political winner for them to the centre of the national debate. So it will be interesting uh, with uh, elections in Georgia and also um, in uh, the midterms next year, just to see how the Democrats can use this to their advantage. Simon, we've got just a minute left to talk about possibly my favourite subject ever. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm not going to sing it, but yes, absolutely. Here they go again, uh, says the Times. Abra prepare for a new voyage. They are back, if, as if they ever went away, did they? I don't know. But uh, yes, after what do you hiatus. Mean you don't know? <laughs> it's been 40 years since they last produced an album, or 39 at any rate. Oh, gosh, but, you're the expert. But, but you're right. I mean, you are right. They are ubiquitous. They have been. They, we never stopped playing them. Of course. But they stopped producing. Good songs. They did, absolutely. But they are coming back next year, next year uh, scheduled on May the 27th. Put that in 
in your diary, in a purpose-built 3,000-capacity arena at uh, the Queen Elizabeth Park, Olympic Park in East London. But don't get too excited. Apparently, it's just digital versions of the uh, the four members of the band. But never mind. Or avatars. Avatar, I love it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Simon Brook, thank you very thank much you. indeed. You're listening to The Globalist on Monocle 24. UBS is a global financial services firm with over 150 years of heritage. Built on the unique dedication of our people, we bring fresh thinking and perspective to our work. We know that it takes a marriage of intelligence and heart to create lasting value for our clients. It's about having the right ideas, of course, but also about having one of the most accomplished systems and an unrivaled network of global experts. That's why at UBS, we pride ourselves on thinking smarter to make a real difference. Tune in to The Bulletin with UBS every week for the latest insights and opinions from UBS all around the world. Time now to talk about the stories making headlines in the world of film. So here is film critic Karen Krasanovich. Good morning to you, Karen. Good morning. morning. Uh, Now, James Bond, I frankly (laughs) just don't particularly see the appeal. You don't. I do. I do. Yes. This misogynist who goes around the world drinking too much and, and, you know, uh, I always identified with him, though. I mean, I never really (laughs) thought of him as a guy. I thought, he's me. You know, he's me. He's got all the good gadgets. Everybody loves him. He, he doesn't He doesn't have to stick around, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, when I grew up, you know, Goldfinger had come out and my brothers painted the lawnmower gold. <laughs> and they were working on the family car. My father finally stopped him. So, no, it's it's a big deal. Uh, Bond is a, is a big deal because before Born, before Mission Impossible, we had this exciting, sexy man. Um, and this is why Bond is such a big deal, still is a big deal, particularly... In Switzerland. <laughs> I know this sounds crazy, but okay. The Bond movie has been delayed so many times, and people have been clutching their bottles of Bollinger with the Bond box, waiting for it to come out. Now, the Zurich Film Festival, which is uh, on the September 23rd to the October the 3rd, has scored a simultaneous premiere, the same time uh, the Bond movie is going to be coming out at the Albert Hall here, um, on September 28th. And it's unprecedented. Now, I'm wondering, how did they do this? And I'm thinking, Switzerland, there's a lot of money in Switzerland, right? So I'm assuming there's some sort of deal done. But what I really, I did a little bit more digging, and it seems that Switzerland and Bond have a particularly close relationship because um, Bond's mother is Swiss. Actually, <laughs> who Wait, knew? But this, this fictional character's fictional Fictioner's mother, mother does yes, come from But Swiss Ursula place. Andres uh, is Swiss <laughs> yeah. and played Honey Rider. And um, yeah, so anyway, it's, it, the Bond, Bond, James Bond in Switzerland go very deep. I'm I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> so we'll be we'll be we'll be hearing from uh, the last apparently the last from from Daniel Craig in the 25th James Bond. The 25th. Do, do we know who's going to take over from him? <gasps> I mean that's such a hot debate. It isn't is a it? hot debate. I, I uh, wish I knew. Might it be the gorgeous guy from um, um, oh whatever it was called? You know that period drama? Um, oh, you mean uh, Bridgerton? Madden? No, who are you thinking? Uh, that the 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 cute one. The cute probably. One. <laughs> Let's hope so. I mean, we were all hoping it would be Idris Elba. Here, here I, I'm dissing James Bond for objectifying women, and I'm doing exactly the same. He's thing. an exciting character, and he's he's had a long longevity that a lot of franchises haven't had. And also, I mean, I mean, I think we all do identify. You know, we we want to be the guy. We want to be the person with the great clothes, the great cars, and the exciting life. Yeah. Well, of course, Bond has been delayed because of COVID, yes. but it's not the only film. No, it really isn't. And and actually, you know, today, um, well, I think it was over, overnight, Patty Jenkins was dissing uh, streaming movies going, movies that are streamed just seem fake to me. And there's this big hubbub on social media about what she said. And people are going, you know, you're wrong. But... We're excited about Bond, and we're even more excited about Mission Impossible, which was supposed to be coming out. And you'll notice I'm using past tense. Top Gun, Maverick, and I know one of your favorites, Jackass Forever. But all of these have been moved to 2022. Uh, Paramount has decided to, to move 
bo- all three of these into next year, and that's because of the Delta variant. Right. Still, still, you know, they're they're thinking a lot of older people like to go to the cinema, and they're worried about their health, and a lot of people are just very wary about still being in the cinema. Although no case of which I'm aware has been traced, no COVID case of of any variant has been traced back to cinema going. Yeah, uh, Karen. I mean, I'm assuming that 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 obviously at the heart of all of these decisions comes finance. Oh yes. Um, is it possible to make the same amount of money without screening it in cinemas? I mean, is this is this about is this about the economics of it, or is it about the experience? It's always about the economics. It's always because if you don't look after the economics, you can't make another film. I mean, the experience is what we pay for, and and, and there is a discussion about film becoming more like opera, where you you know it's more expensive, and you make a date, and it's an event. You get a babysitter, and you go. Um, but no. The streaming films, from from all the data we have, do not create the amount of revenue needed to make big blockbusters, generally smaller films. So if you want to see a big blockbuster that has international locations and lots of special effects and big stars, it has to go through theatrical. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, let's talk about the Venice Film Festival. Yes. Very excited. I wish I was there. I wish I wasn't. I'm, was, I'm working on a movie right now, so I can't be in Venice, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, the Lido last year did did a live event when everybody was afraid, and this year they're doing it even better because they've got the COVID regulations in place. People are used to it, and stars are feeling safer. So a lot more stars are coming, including Jamie Lee Curtis, who's who's going to get um, an award there. Which she said she was very surprised at this, um, but also big big films are going there. Uh, and another thing that I think is really interesting is that the jury has four women and three men. How sexist! <laughs> <laughs> but we're, I mean, it opened. It opened with the uh, the uh, Pablo uh, that the uh, Elmo Devar movie, um, which oh no, I'm suddenly why can't I find my notes on this anyway? But today, well, I can tell you, Pe- uh, Penelope Cruz, of you. course, uh, stars in the movie, yes. and it, people are talking at it about it being a, a sort of return to to his his earlier work, to his funny stuff, yeah, which is a shame. We used to say that about Woody Allen, who I liked his funny stuff. But, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it's gotten really good reviews and it's, ni- it's a nice opener. But today, the big excitement is around June because we've been waiting for June to come out. We know it's finished and that's going to be uh, that's actually going to be filmed, uh, uh, sorry, screened, I think, this afternoon in Venice. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, Spencer. Uh, the Pablo Laran uh, movie about uh, Lady Di before she got married, and also Ridley Scott's first film since 2017 called The Last Duel, which is supposed to be, it's a 14th century story taken from, a, it's kind of a Me Too story uh, based on the female perspective. That sounds absolutely fascinating. When, when does it finish, Venice? Um, I think that, you know what? It goes on for a while. Have it we got does time go to get on there? For a while. <laughs> I, you know, I wish I did. I wish all my friends are there. And uh, unfortunately, I've got to start another movie next week, so I won't be able to go next week either. But it's wonderful. Do keep track of your favorite uh, favorite reviewers. For example, Robbie Robbie Collin is there from the Telegraph, and he's always good to read. Karen, thank you very much indeed. That was Karen Krasanovich. And this is The Globalist on Monocle 24. Earlier this week, our senior editor, Nolan Giles, ventured up from Zurich to the headquarters of Audi in Ingolstadt to meet with Henrik Wenders, head of brand at Audi AG, and Mark Lichter, head of design. They were present to reveal to the international press the Grand Sphere, a new electric autonomous vehicle the company is planning to release in 2025. We hear from them now as they take a tour of the concept car iteration of the vehicle, which is an impressive futuristic take on the limousine. So Henrik, maybe we'll start with you. Where are we standing? Well, where am I standing and where are you sitting? I'm sitting in the future, actually. I'm sitting in an experienced device, which is formerly known as car. In this particular case, it's called the Audi Grand Sphere concept. And I think I have the man behind the design of the concept also sitting in the car. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what we're uh, talking about today? I'm head of Audi Design, Mark Lichter, and I'm sitting in the first row in a first-class seat in a vehicle which showcases in perfection progressive luxury from our perspective. It's an open space. We have the biggest interior which we ever had at Audi. I would say if you open the door of this vehicle, a revolution is becoming visible. 
Let's begin with what separates this from a conventional vehicle on the road right now. So first of all, I would say the proportion. Because it's designed from inside out, that means there's a huge interior space. So it's almost a monobox volume, but, and we are really proud about this, it's not visible. On, on each perspective, it looks like that this is a Gran Turismo with breathtaking proportions. And if you turn around that, you recognize, oh, this car is opening new perspectives. And we don't want to break the viewing habits like we learned for the last 100 years that a long bonnet is offering prestige and status. So this is something radically new. And Hendrik, maybe that's an important talking point, this idea of what people really want from the next generation of vehicles. Because like Mart said, it's still a car, right? So why is it important to keep those traces of what's come before? I think when you define the future, you have uh, the strategic question to answer. How do you want to approach the future? Revolutionary or evolutionary? And I think we did both. Uh, from the outside, we are playing and interpreting classic experiences and are following our own strategy that we are applying an evolution yeah, because from the three-quarter rear you see a beautiful, beautiful GT uh, body shape. When you approach the car, the experience begins already by, uh, because uh, the car recognizes my gait and therefore it opens the door for me and then I become a user of this device and then the holistic immersive experience comes into play and that of course needs to be curated and that's the reason why Mark and I and our teams are collaborating as intense as possible because it needs to be a seamless user slash customer journey where I'm combining the digital experiences which we are using and appreciating at home already outside of the car and I simply continue in this sphere and due to the fact that I'm applying personal very human centric experiences it can become and it will become our second place Mark before you you said you're a bit of a car nut you you have obsessions with car design you know you, you obviously know the history very well you've designed lots of cars so I'd love to hear about kind of what the inspiration was in terms of you know the lines the aesthetics what kind of did you want to bring from the past so you know this car's from design process is a revolution because it's the first car which has been designed from the inside out. That means there is a huge cabin which is an elite. So unlike uh, Hendrik mentioned already, from three-quarter rear view, it looks almost like a classical GT. If you walk around record right now, it's not. And then we add very futuristic details, you know, and this is inspired by the wind tunnel. It's very simple, you know, we are living efficiency. This car is shaped in a wind tunnel. And we came up with these sophisticated details like this air curtain in the front, like this flush rocker, like this huge diffuser. So, and I like the connection of this very clean and simple and muscular body shape. And then in contrast, these super futuristic aerodynamic details. And this is something which is inspired by the wind tunnel, of course. And then second detail is this DLO, you know, it's a very upright one. And there is this strong break. The reason is I want to have not only the, the longest interior space, I want to have the widest as well. And the result is something really futuristic. And Henrik, I know you're a fan as well, but just finally, we're looking at a vehicle here which will be fully autonomous, where people can read a book, eat dinner, do whatever they want in the car without even thinking about steering the thing. How far away are we? Because it sounds, it's going to sound pretty surprising to our listeners, I think, how close we are to this. This is the reason why we decided to start the journey with a concept car. Because those immersive experiences and the reason why we are calling it an experience a device needs to be pre-communicated. And this is the reason why we are sharing it with the world in September 2021. Because we are in the serial production making process already in order to make sure that mid of this century which is uh, taking place in a couple of years going to be there already so 2025 uh, exactly so as of then you will be able to experience this in reality and there's one additional point which is invisible but very important to all of us because we all know climate change cannot be postponed we need to get rid of co2 and this is the reason why mark and i are so happy that we are entering a future which is going to become CO2 neutral. We are producing our products in some plants CO2 neutral on balance already. We are offering products which you can use without emitting CO2. And in this beautiful case, it is again one example that it's possible to keep the audiences on an amazing experience level at the same time getting rid of this dangerous CO2. 
And that was Monocle Nolan Giles in conversation with Audi's Henrik Wenders and Mark Lichter. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks to our producers, Paige Reynolds and Charlie Filmer Court. Our studio manager today was Chris Ablakwa with editing assistance from Steph Chungu and Christy Evans. After the headlines, there's more music on the way. The briefing is live at midday in London and The Globalist returns at the same time on Monday. I'm Georgina Godwin. I'll be back with you tomorrow on Saturday for the weekend edition. I hope you can join me then. Meanwhile, thank you for listening. Monocle and UBS are proud to present A Nobel Cause, a book that celebrates more than half a century of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. A Nobel Cause gives an overview of the 84 winning laureates and their influence on global society. It builds excitement around economics by talking to the laureates and unpacking their theories, from a pioneer in the field of the economics of climate change to an Israeli psychologist who changed the way we think about thinking. The winner's stories make for an incredibly diverse read. As well as real-life case studies of applications of the prize-winning theories, you'll find an illustrated history of global economics. Alongside a look ahead at what we can expect over the next 50 years, you can discover the story of Alfred Nobel himself and the legacy of his awards. On sale from October 2020 from Monocle and UBS, purchase the book from our retail stores or from monocle.com. A Nobel cause, asking the questions that shape our world.